Been working on the clinical theory as usual. <laughs> <laughs> and I did a mind map. Da da da. We can put that on. We can, we can oh, put that on. Maps. We can put that on screen. Yeah, I love mind maps. Show you the mind yes, map. Yes, I think you should be very casual this time. Yeah. Like you I'm know. Get more comfortable with it. just yeah. being more casual. Yeah. So, uh, so this is. It's all about the quintessence, right? The fives. The fives keep showing up. So, here's here's our new five element clinical theory. We've got structure, function, we've got the mind. Oh, structure, function, let me do that again, I'll do it in a different order. So the quintessence of the new improved clinical theory is we'll start with the big picture. We have five different elements that we need to consider to have a complete theory of healing, of, of being human. <laughs> Structure, hey, we got the body, right? Structure, material, material world. Our, our culture, you know, pretty much gets, mostly gets stuck there. But we need to understand not only structure, but function. And they're related, obviously, there's a correlation, there's a connection between structure and function. If the structure isn't, you know, structure's broken, it doesn't function right, right? But the structure can be not broken, and the function can still be not right. And we can improve function. We can improve, if we improve function, then structure improves over time according to that improved function. In other words, structure is a, a fossil of function. It's, it's, it's a coherence over time produced by function. Question? So that would be uh, also if we have bad function that's changeable, you know, like say bad posture or something, that's going to affect our structure over time too. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, like the study back in the 1950s the, with tens of thousands of school children in, in Texas, and they found that because of the, the structure of the, of the space that the children are in with, with uh, big windows to, on one side, just on one side, not on the other side in the classroom, the children would have to turn their heads to avoid having this asymmetry in their visual field because we're heliocentric organisms. We want a balance of light in our visual field quadrants. And so they'd turn away from the window. And so that twist in the body would start creating an asymmetry in the vision and it would show up in the in the spine and in the, the teeth because of the posture and so over from year, year to year they could start measuring all these structural abnormalities and, and diseases in the children and if they created classrooms that were designed to be easy on the body and the eye and function and you know have the right angles proper angles for for uh, what now we'd call ergonomic function that they didn't have those kinds of structural problems produced in, in the children from year to year. So, so we have structure and the function, and, and the next level is really a type of function, but, but on a more subtle level of energy, the function of, of energy. You know, we know our nerves carry energy, we know our, our blood vessels carry energy, we know the connective tissue carries energy, there's electrical energy, there's, there's magnetic Muscles. fields. The muscles are an electrical response as well. Yep. So, so the energy view, the energy level, is more of the physics, uh, and 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 that's a key component. Now, structure, function, and energy, we kind of are the the limits of what we can easily measure in the material world, material view of things. So, so, but that's not where we want to stop. You know, we can say, oh, we measured the, 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 the three parts of the energy and we calculated the energy in microwatts in the biological fluid according to the Nernst equation. So we know that they're in phase two, which is where there can be bacterial growth or parasites. And uh, that's great. We're, lo we're still all looking at the, the, the biological body, but we haven't touched upon the spirit, on the consciousness. So, so now we want to look at the mind we know the mind is half of the effect of any medicine, of any treatment. 
So we have to bring that into our model explicitly. We have to say, yeah, the mind is something, even if we can't say exactly what it is. And we are going to try to say exactly what we think it is. Now, by saying that, we can be disproven or we can be supported by the evidence that exists. And I, I think so far we're supported by the evidence that exists. Every time I come up with a new question, I say, well, according to the model, here's what it should be. From what I know of science, as I love studying all the sciences, I was a high honors Ivy League graduate in science, and uh, 30 years of exploring and trying to figure out why does healing work the way it does? Why is the mind so important in healing? I was started out as a mind healer, working on vision. And hearing, sometimes when there's a sound, we might not see as well. Or some people need to close their eyes in order to be able to hear clearly. So there's interference between the different senses. Wow, what's, that, that's, where's that going on? So there's, it's going on in the brain, yes, but it's not only the biology of the brain, it's also the physics of the brain. And we're going to get really deep into that. Because it, it all begins to tie together. And it ties together with, with the cutting edge science, with Nobel Prize winning research that you know, has yet to make its way to the clinic floor, but it needs to be. We need, we need that research to really understand what's going on and how to, how to approach healing in a, in a deeper way, in a more effective way. So the, so the mind, again, it's half of healing, half, we know the half of the toxins, bringing it, you know, the connection between these quintessential fractal parts. The, the mind produces half of the toxins in human tissue. They're the breakdown products of neurotransmitters and hormones of stress. Half of the toxicity, half of the healing. We can't ignore that half. We can't say, we have a theory of everything that we're producing in our mind, this theory of everything, but the theory of everything doesn't explain or consider the mind as part of everything. <laughs> Sorry. You know, it may be self-consistent within itself, but, it, but it's not complete. <laughs> it doesn't consider, it doesn't, can't model where it, where it came from. Where did that model come from? Oh, no, no, this is about subatomic particles. Okay, nice, great. But it's not going to help you heal. That not, is not a model that's going to help you understand how your body heals or how your mind interfaces with that healing process in a critical way. And so, but that's four, but we still need the spirit because that's the holy grail. It's the vessel that holds the mind. It's the vessel that holds the mind when the body is dead. When the brain is flatlined, when the person's having an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience and seeing that body on the gurney from the corner of the room and noticing where the glasses were put, and this is a real case, real life case, the brain was flatlined. The body was dead. The body was not seeing anything. The body was having no experience. The body never has an experience on its own, but when the spirit is in the house, <laughs> then it is cooperating, coordinating with spirit experiences through the body. So yeah, body, mind, spirit, we're dividing the body into structure, function, and energy. So there's the, the trinity of the body, but then there's the trinity of the whole person, the body, mind, spirit. And, and again, they're, they're intimately connected, and that's what we're going to go into in more detail as we go into each of these areas. <laughs>